This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're having a wonderful Friday. And uh, we have with us Will Sparrow, State Senator from Ever Beach. We are so happy to have him here. Will, thank you for coming down. Aloha, Jay. And we have Ken Rogers, retired Canadian businessman, our color commentator <laughs> this week, who's my house guest and visiting Hawaii, and we've known each other since 1962, but who's counting? <laughs> well, someone has to pick on American there you go. regulations. It's a role. <laughs> So, Will, you know, you, you, you had an interesting experience this afternoon. Before we get to the principal topic, which is marijuana, how are we doing right now, I would like to discuss uh, the hearing that you had or, um, th this afternoon on the question of suicide in Hawaii. Yes, yes. Uh, we passed the uh, House Concurrent Resolution 66 in 2016. And this resolution calls for a working group, a task force, uh, to look at suicide prevention and to work on a strategy uh, to reduce suicides in Hawaii by 25% by 2025. And uh, this is a working group that had stakeholders across the board, government, nonprofit, business, uh, just stakeholders that have a strong interest in uh, reducing suicide in those who, who help um, with um, families and even uh, victims who have tried to commit suicide and have failed. Uh, and, and this is an area, as you know, um, nationally it's a problem, uh, more so than locally. I mean, I mean there used to be numbers where uh, military personnel were, I believe it was 20, 22 a day nationally committing suicide. And I believe in Hawaii the numbers around uh, one every two or three days. So it's certainly a problem that we need to address and, and there are many avenues to deal with it, uh, including prevention. One thing we certainly need to do is put more resources into it and this task force will be releasing its findings and recommendations to the legislature, hopefully by the, either the end of the year or early part of January. Very interesting. And, uh, you know, I would add, I think that suicide affects us all. It affects yes. our economy. It affects, it's so disruptive to the families involved. Uh, we would all be better off if there were fewer suicides, for sure. So. Oh, definitely. And, and there's, uh, people need to just understand, um, you know, don't give up. Never give up. There's always someone yeah. who's out there to help you. There's a, a suicide hotline. There's even a text line. 741 741. I just found that out today. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just for those people who might be contemplating this, um, please don't because um, there's always um, hope and there's always um, a better future yeah. that, that you can work on. And there's many people that are more than happy to, to hold your hand and to help you and guide you and, and be your partner. Yeah. You do have some control over your quality of life and your mental condition. Yes. So um, what, what happens now? What's the next thought? I mean, you talked about a report that's coming out. Yes. And my, my guess is that at least some people, including you, are considering legislation to try to deal with this. Yes, yes. And even maybe taking this group and, and making it a, a permanent group uh, that's, you know, no funding involved, but, you know, a group of stakeholders that would meet on a regular basis and, and talk about what's happening and what needs to be done and making certain that we are on that right path, whatever that path may be. And I know, um, you know between, uh, they, they mentioned hope, help, healing, you know, and then you know, evaluation as, as part of the strategy to, to look at um, how we can do better. What I like about it is that the ledge is looking at an issue which is really central in the, what do you want to call it, the family and social life of our society. Um, and uh, ultimately, the likelihood is there'll be action and, and some uh, improve, improvement about it. So that's great. Yes, yes. Thank you for being involved in that. Yeah. Perhaps a little bridge to the next subject, um, because in Canada we have a severe uh, problem with suicides in our um, very young Native people. And it's very closely related to drug problems mm. in these very remote communities. Uh, there's a lot of um, 
uh, native uh, villages or towns, whatever you want to call them, of, you know, from 500 people to 1,500 people in which the suicide rates are, are absolutely alarming. It makes it a national problem in Canada. But the drugs are a big connection. Uh, is there a fine line between um, taking drugs like such as, for example, opioids um, and taking drugs in order to in order to kill yourself, or as a result of taking drugs, you wind up affirmatively killing yourself, or are the opioid, opioids killing you? In other words, it's sort of a vague line between an intentional and an erroneous, you know, judgment in taking the drugs. Well, our drug deaths basically relate more to fentanyl, or people who are taking, uh, whether it's prescribed opiates or their um, opiates that they've bought as after they've used marijuana as a gateway drug and they've met all the underworld people and you know when the dealer is out of some uh, good BC bud or whatever they were looking for in marijuana the dealer will say oh well have I got a deal for you I've got this really neat and wonderful stuff that'll you know give you as good a high as uh, as THC component of, of marijuana so it's an unintentional uh, <clears throat> death that way well if you say somebody is intentionally dealing with an underworld person <laughs> you know yeah there, there's the you know but um, everybody's been stupid in their life and and yeah. people continue to to be willing to uh, make dumb moves well, you, you know, you, it's a good uh, segue uh, to get from this issue to the issue of uh, marijuana. And I was not really aware, but uh, there are places uh, on the mainland, states on the mainland, Alaska, for example, my wife and I found uh, last summer, um, that have marijuana and uh, are gone further, actually, than Hawaii has. And I wonder, just to set the stage here, uh, what's the legal condition of marijuana in Canada? Well, we have medical marijuana nationally and that's existed for quite a while and it's fairly liberal in the methodology of dealing with it but a little bit like the united states where you have states uh, with certain rights and the feds with certain other rights in canada our our provinces deal with the methodology of distribution that is would a dispensary be only from a government controlled uh, uh, let's say that it, many provinces have provincial liquor boards and the only place you could buy liquor for many many years was from a government controlled liquor store uh, the biggest province in Canada by far population wise Ontario has decided that the method they're going to allow the dispensing of recreational marijuana like recreational marijuana will become legal throughout Canada uh, next July 1st. But uh, subject to subject each, to adoption by each province. Well, each province gets to decide the method by which it will be distributed. Mm. Uh, and a lot of that is political thinking that this is going to be a financial windfall so in a, sure in, from a tax point of view. But also there's the health factor of, of trying to control it and keep it from well, minors. I want to ask you one question. One of, the, one of the issues, and I'm sure Senator Sparrow can you know, talk about this is we're in a position right now at a time of of watching, of seeing how it works as a medical uh, ma marijuana kind of uh, uh, permission, and and I, I'm really curious to know whether there have been problems in the mer medical marijuana um, s state of things in Canada, problems involving uh, you know who knows what accidents, crime. Uh, gateway examples of gateway problems or has it been um, relatively benign during this period uh, no the experience is almost the opposite is by liberalizing the use of marijuana uh, and in some areas of Canada they do not do any enforcing of recreational marijuana even though it's illegal Still technically illegal. technically illegal yeah. um, <clears throat> but it um, it really has uh, reduced the use of other drugs and the reduction of the use of things like fentanyl because if you can access the marijuana for medical purposes, the people that are desperate to have 
marijuana because it will do magical things for some ailments. Yes. Um, you know, for some people, if they get the right mixture of compounds, um, well, then they're no longer in the underworld market. The underworld financing is less. you haven't seen in the newspapers uh, where problems have taken place. Uh, you know, any reports of difficulties? With no, marijuana. no, no. So this no. has been, in that it's, sense, it's, it's been a it's, successful, uh, oh yeah, successful um, development. It's almost Canada. like saying, "How could we have been so dumb not to have done this <laughs> sooner?" <laughs> you must have some comments well, about this, Will. Interesting, you're talking about Canada, and um, I am not at all an expert on Canadian medical marijuana or its program. However. I was at a conference this past weekend on Kauai. It was the International Cannabis Business Conference. And it goes around the world. Uh, this weekend it was on Kauai. They also have it in San Francisco, Vancouver, and Toronto, and Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, but I met this gentleman named Sean Deng. He's the CFO and the chairman of MMJ Canada, which is the largest retail establishment with uh, $45 million in sales. And he mentioned there in Toronto, as you mentioned, Ontario, as well as in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. And he was explaining to me that, I mean, the, the business is growing with the new um, prime minister and, and him wanting to legalize that uh, there's going to be a lot of opportunities, but there's still a lot of uh, unknown. It's almost like the Wild West. As Ken said, each jurisdiction, each city, each province is going to be able to dictate some of the rules and legislation. So you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see where Canada goes with this. Yeah. And that's even well, sort of like California, because yeah. even in California, you know, what they do in San Francisco might be different than what they do in L.A. or in San Diego. So they're allowing the jurisdictions to have a certain amount of control, uh, which is a little different than our medical marijuana program here, which was passed by state law. And, and basically, you know, all the dispensaries uh, on all the neighbor islands follow the same rules, the, the same legislation. Uh, they do have to go to the counties for their zoning and permitting for their facilities. But outside of that, the counties cannot stop it or, or be an obstacle in, in terms of these uh, opportunities and for, for the dispensaries and the patient's use. You know, a week ago, I, I almost forgot, but this is something we should talk about. A week ago, HPD said that if you uh, have a, a, a gun registered to you under the gun registration law, uh, that meant, uh, or rather, if you had a medical license for cannabis, you could not have a gun. You had to turn in your gun. Uh, and then it reversed that a few days later under pressure from people who had guns and, and wanted to have uh, medical cannabis licenses. So what's your thought about that? Well, for starters, I believe the chief is re-looking at that policy and seeing how they will be um, implementing it or, or even enforcing it or not. Because one issue is a person can have a medical marijuana card but not possess medical marijuana, medical cannabis. Mm -hmm. So uh, just because you have a card doesn't mean you, you are using, uh, you may use. So with, with that said, I, I do feel that there should not be a nexus between guns and medical cannabis uh, that uh, medical cannabis patient can be a law-abiding citizen and can own a gun and their Second Amendment right should not be trampled. Now what the Attorney General has done, and he did this just recently on the gun uh, permit application, he put a question, are you a medical marijuana patient or user? So with that, he might be looking at a way to screen these individuals so they cannot purchase a gun. But yeah. again, that's a discussion that's actually going on right now. Yeah. And it's possible there could be legislation on this. I don't know. We'll yeah. see. I don't know enough on the federal side. But uh, it did 
get a lot of people riled up when this hit the news. Yeah, well, because nobody was aware that this was happening, and and this was look, these letters were going out as as uh, far back as 2016. Interesting. Yes. That sounds. Well, you know, that it, sounds like an odd. Yeah. Item because nobody says, D "Are you a drinker? Do you do you drink wine? Right. Do you drink right. scotch, rum, right. rye, vodka?" Well, in the anything? whole issue is the notion that maybe marijuana makes you unqualified or a danger um, to have a gun. And right after this break, I'd like to ask you, Ken, you've been looking at the cannabinoid issue and the, the biochemical issue, and I wonder if we could address that. Is marijuana something that makes you irresponsible to the point we should, where a license for mar marijuana should affect a license for a gun on a, on a you know, sort of a... Uh, the effect of the, of, the, of the marijuana kind of basis. Well, let's take a short break, we'll come back, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. All right. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solution, how to make a brighter day. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. Okay, we're back, we're live. We left you with a, a cliffhanger question is exactly what does the literature say about the cannabis issue uh, and how does cannabis affect the natural, you know, natural, the organic process of your body and your brain and what it does to you and whether we should be concerned about that going forward. So what did you find, Ken? Well, when I researched it, uh, one of the compounds in uh, marijuana or cannabis is uh, called THC and THC is the component that gives you a high like having a couple of glasses of scotch um, and the interesting thing about medical marijuana though is that each condition that you're trying to treat is different so that over time uh, the cultivation of marijuana has has an uh, created a whole bunch of strains. So you'll have one strain of, of marijuana where the, uh, the ratio of THC is say four to one, where the other key chemical component called CBD, but CBD is the one that provides the majority of the health benefits. Uh, however, the experience with the medical marijuana was there's what they call an entourage effect that is the combination of the chemicals together helps do the magical things that uh, marijuana can do, particularly in killing cancer cells. Uh, <clears throat> however, that, um, you know, every person is different and every plant is different, so it's really important to have the labs and what we're really missing is, is uh, clinical trials. Yes, well, let's talk about that because that's on the road to recreational. So you've opened, uh, we, we've permitted the opening of a lab here in Honolulu and one in Maui recently, and we're pretty scientific about this to determine the contaminants in the marijuana that's being sold at the dispensaries. Right. It's all impressive how, how careful the labs are and what their testing equipment is like. How is it going, Will? The medical marijuana program is slowly making progress. Uh, we allowed up to 16 dispensaries uh, and retailers to open. We only have three. So obviously we have a long ways to go, but uh, I'm hoping that by next year, most of them, if not all of them, will be up and running. And um, there's eight licensees, so they each have two. And even the labs, um, we've got two now, and, and there might be another one coming, but uh, uh, that, that remains to be seen. Um, 
Hopefully, it's going to go well for everyone. We haven't heard any. You have no incidents to report. Mm, yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen anything in the newspaper that's negative. Right. You know, you read or heard once or twice that they ran out of product. That's not a problem. But that's because they just opened. It's in its infancy. Uh, we allowed uh, originally up to 2,000 plants, and we recently passed uh, an additional 3,000. So each dispensary can grow 5,000 plants. I don't think anyone's even close to that. But um, uh, yeah, we'll 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 see how it goes next year. Right? I think next year will be the the indicator where we'll be able to look at some data. Um, but I think there was a a report out recently that they said about 1.3 million in sales to date, um, and that's that's all in like 90 days. In this, right? right. So so that that shows that there's a demand, and I've heard some comments about the quality, uh, but I expect that the quality will go up. Um, I think and, the price will go down. And the price will go down too. Yeah, that was another comment that. The price per ounce right now is a little high, but again, supply and demand and competition will force it down, I believe, because if it doesn't, then the black market sure. will continue well, and flourish, and right? Yeah, so yeah. Even with quality, lesser quality marijuana. Right, so you're not going to get rid of the black market, but you could make a major dent in it if you yeah. have a a good dispensary product at a decent price yeah. and hopefully that's where we'll be going. Yeah, just like Ken was saying. But one of the things you guys have been talking about, or you did uh, a minute ago, Ken, is uh, clinical trials. Because if you're looking for a long-term understanding, if you're looking for you know, sort of a scientific look at this, um, you test like crazy during the recreational period to see uh, what we got in terms of the quality, what we got in terms of the medical effect, uh, with, and the doctors can be more confident that way. Um, so the question is, do we have uh, clinical trials going? Will there be? Are there plans for that? No. The, Would it help? <clears throat> what, well, clinical trial may be a bit futile because if I have one variety of marijuana and, uh, and half the people in the trial are using my variety and the other half are using Will's variety and... and the compounds in mine are very different than his. And, and what uh, I found peculiar, especially uh, in California, because they've got uh, more scale there, is that if you go into a dispensary and you pick up a, a small bottle of, of uh, oil, let's say, uh, which you want to use for medical purposes, you have trouble on the labeling you know, what is in it. And if you went back to the same dispensary a month later to get a refill because what you had worked really well for your arthritis or, you know, as a pain reliever or whatever particular purpose you picked it for, uh, and you bought the same thing again, it won't be the same. Now, this suggests, it all suggests that maybe the most important thing is labeling and the most important thing is standardization of the product um, and the, you know, the way it's, it's built and sold so everybody knows the score and the doctors know the score. Well, it's almost like the labs you have should produce what's being sold in the dispensaries. That, that the thing, labs only test, though. That's right. all they do. Yes, but you've got to test to tell what's in it. Well, I think, I think that it, it, who's running well, that? Is this Department of Health? Who's running that? Running the labs or the running the standards. Well, the, as far as the state is concerned, it's run by the Department of Health. Yeah. But going back to your question on uh, you know um, medical data and clinics and all that, uh, we still have the issue of it marijuana cannabis being Schedule One, and because it's Schedule One, um, a lot of people are concerned that the federal government you know could crack down or do mm -hmm. bad things for people involved in that. So you don't see a lot of research, you know, you get um, anecdotal information, you hear and read about people who are patients who are using and have great results. Um, one thing I'm gonna do this year is introduce the bill. 
For recreational? Well, no. This is, has to do with research. Okay. Um, uh, but start having, if we can get this bill passed, the University of Hawaii um, collect data from patients, and this would be a voluntary um, That's great. research so important. Um, that they're getting information from the patient. See, the university does not do testing and doesn't want to do any research because they're, they're not going to touch any flower, they're not going to touch any plant because of the, the schedule, schedule one. one issue. Yeah. But if they can, at the very least, begin a database of patients out there who are willing to tell the University of Hawaii Medical School uh, the dosage they're using, the ailments, and the results, at least we can get some preliminary information um, before we eventually get to uh, full-blown institutions, universities, yeah. healthcare facilities yeah. doing full-scale research and development. But because of the federal law and the Schedule One, which is really asinine and really ridiculous, <laughs> it says that you don't have medicinal use when we all know that there is medicinal use. Yeah, it's clear. But because this is a political issue, um, and and Congress and or the president needs to act, and and lack of that action and leadership, we're we're in this funk right now, and states are taking the it lead. It sounds to me like uh, you know the federal government is important in the road to recreational, because if the federal government you know continues with the schedule of one thing and trying to enforce enforce it in you know specific oddball circumstances, then stopping, for example, the the payment and the banking arrangements, all that. <clears throat> it's it's slow going, right. um, but if one day the federal government should say, okay, okay, let's take it off schedule one. You know, all these states are passing laws. Canada has passed laws. I mean, the the whole thing is easing up. There's no point in, as you mentioned, this. The federal government has a patent, so at least some people in the federal government have believed that this <laughs> was medicinal. Um, so I'm just wondering, is the Department of Health the federal U.S. Department of Health yeah, that has, has a, patent. a patent that says cannabis is wonderful for certain medical right. purposes. And they had to yes. make that argument in applying for the patent. So mm -hmm. what happened? Anyway, you have a sense, Will, about where the federal government is going. And I mean to refer to this administration with all of their foibles. No, I don't. But I can speculate that we have eight states today that have legalized and that they're moving forward. Uh, the federal government and the president, they've got, they're, they're into their eyeballs on other issues. Ah, from, you noticed. You know, <laughs> and, you know, I wonder, does the federal government want to tackle and get into a fight with the states over cannabis or medical cannabis? Because Medical cannabis, we have uh, 29 states in the D.C., so 30. So the majority of the states have medical cannabis. And now eight states and other states are looking at um, adult use and recreational. So that train is moving. And does the federal government, with California likely leading the way, want to get into a big fight and a major lawsuit and years and years of talking about an issue that both red and blue states are are involved in. You know, I don't think this is a partisan issue uh, when you look at it, uh, really you get down to the roots of it. Um, this is this is big business. This yeah. is an economic driver. This is yeah. an opportunity to, to raise taxes and to help with many of the issues and concerns it's a that win, we all win, are dealing with. No lose right. It, so yeah. uh, you know, I'm hoping that the Hawaii might look at it seriously in four or five years but we need to get our medical cannabis program up and running and make sure that's operating smoothly i think if anything we might look at decriminalization and that's something from that's, of decriminalization right and that's something the senate has supported but the house hasn't but it's possible that we could look at criminalization first which is what many of the states did on the mainland they decriminalized it and then they legalized it and, and that's an option for us down the road. Very exciting times. <clears throat> this issue is alive. This issue is under consideration by many people. This, you know, we talked to somebody this morning who was here for another show.
from the state of Tennessee. And they said a lot of people in Tennessee would like to see this happen. So I think we have a we have a sweeping you know movement around the country, maybe the world. You mentioned Germany, uh, you know, to, to go this direction. So after a while, no, we'll I, go I was interested in your answer. What the federal government in the United States would do, and and uh, one of the big differences between Canada and the U.S. is is health, and so Canadians always think anything to do with health in the U.S. has a cynical touch. You'll never get med a marijuana for recreational purposes because the big drug lobby will <laughs> win out. I mean, certainly, if you allow recreational marijuana and you have people growing 5,000 plants in, in uh, Hawaii, that's going to take away a lot of their drug business. Yeah. Like, like you, the, the most obvious use of marijuana was for pain. Yeah. And it, that's well, the opiates well, well, and all of the stuff that are supporting all drugs. We're out of companies. time, gentlemen. Okay. So I just want to say, when they used to say, plus ça change, plus la même, now they say, plus ça change, plus ça change. <laughs> it's all changing. This is changing. You know, and good for us, good for you, that we recognize the change that we participate in. Thank you so much, Willis Barrow. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you, Jay. Ken Rogers, thank you very much. Thanks, Senator. Thank you, sir. Aloha.